lives today and all this week. As you've noticed from the bulletin, today is LWML Sunday, Lutheran Women's Missionary League, which is a, an, uh, an adjunct of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. It's been around for a long time. Our local uh, expression of that is the Women of Hope here at Hope Lutheran Church. And uh, so all of the women who are members of the church, you're automatically part of the Women of Hope. So I hope that you'll be a part of that and encourage it and enjoy it and use it uh, as much as you're able to do. I'm excited at what happens there. Um, you know, next year they have their annual convention. I think it's in, uh, in uh, where is it? In Lexington, Lexington Kentucky. Yes, right. Yeah, the, 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 where the horse races are. And uh, so we have some of our women that are talking about going. I think that would be great. I hope a whole bunch of you can go and have a great time. I was looking at the tapes of last year's convention, which was down in Mobile, Alabama, and they were so marvelous. There were interludes in between the speakers where this woman came out. Her name was Jan Strzok, and she'd do these little humorous uh, soliloquies where she was pretending to talk to a friend on the phone. And it started out where she was all sour on the whole thing. She said, Dr. May, these people are so perky and boisterous and they sing so loud. There's so many of these women. And, and Dora May is saying to her, stop having a hissy fit. She says, I am not having a hissy fit. No one has a hissy fit. I am pitching a hissy fit. <laughs> but of course, by the end of the conference, she's filled with joy. And she's all on board. And that's how the Lord works in all of our lives, isn't it? When God starts to work in your life, you start pitching a hissy fit. But as he continues in his love and in the Holy Spirit to capture your heart, that turns over into something beautiful and wonderful. And that's what I pray for each one of you. So our opening hymn today is Open Now the Gates of Beauty. And I'll ask you in the last verse, please, to stay. <laughs> Yeah. 
Jesus Christ, thy mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, and bear kingdom fruit to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for you. For his sake forgives you all your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you please rise for the verse and remain standing for the reading of the gospel? <laughs> Hallelujah, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. <clears throat> Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds, because they held him to be a prophet. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the hymn.
I'd like to give you this opportunity because it's LWML Sunday uh, for the women to take the LWML flight. So you don't have to do this, don't feel obligated, but I'd like to invite as many as desire of the women to stand now and recite the pledge and I'll ask Nate Nadine, would you uh, lead them all and kick it off for me? Thank you. <laughs> In fervent gratitude for the Savior's dying love and his blood brought gift of redemption, we dedicate ourselves to him with all that we are and have. And in obedience to his call for workers in the harvest fields, we pledge him our willing service wherever and whenever he has need of us. We consecrate to our Savior our hands to work for him, our feet to go on his errands, our voice to sing his praises, our lips to proclaim his redeeming love, our silver and our gold to descend his kingdom, our will to do his will, and every power of our life to the great task of bringing the lost and the erring into eternal fellowship with him. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. God, thank you and bless the LWML and the women of hope. Amen. Grace and mercy and peace to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My text is the Gospel text from Matthew 21. So last week I mentioned in that week's Gospel text that it was one of several that occurred during Holy Week in Jerusalem, probably on Tuesday of that week, in which Jesus is coming strongly into confrontation with the religious leaders there. And it's increasing the tension, and it's going to climax, of course, that week in his crucifixion. And today's text continues that. It's another one of those confrontational stories. And in it, Jesus tells the parable of the tent. So you heard it read. Uh, the, the master plants a vineyard. He puts a fence around it to protect it, digs the wine press, builds a tower so that it can be surveyed and guarded against intruders and animals, and then he leases it out to tenants. And when it's time for the harvest, he sends servants to get the fruit, and the tenants abuse and even kill the servants. And when more servants are sent, he does the same to them. So he sends his son thinking that surely he will be treated with respect. But the tenants kill the son, thinking that then they might be able to get the inheritance for themselves. <clears throat> now, whenever we read a parable in the scriptures, typically what we start to do is to try to, 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 to determine what the points of correspondence are in that parable. The parable is a story, right? And there are different things in the story, or perhaps characters in the story, which match up to something in real life. So if we want to understand what the story means, we have to make those connections, right? So, so let's start that, then, with some of the easy ones. So the master of the vineyard, the one who owns the whole thing, the one who's in charge of everything, who is that? God. Right, that's right, that's God. The son of the master of the vineyard, who comes and is killed by the tenants. Who is that? Christ. That would be Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's right. The servants who were sent prior to the coming of the Son, who were the emissaries of the Master, who is God, who were mistreated and even killed. Who are they? Prophets. That would be the prophets. Right, very good. You have the prophets who came before and were not received by the people. Remember the lament that Jesus made? It's coming up in chapter 23 of Matthew. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Or Stephen, when he was martyred later on in the book of Acts, and he said, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. So those were the prophets, the ones who came and were mistreated by the people when they brought the word of God. By the way, don't you think the intrigue and the drama of this thing just ratchets way up with this story? You know, this is happening on probably Tuesday of Holy Week. By Thursday, these very same chief priests and Pharisees and elders of the people will be plotting to kill Jesus after he just told this parable publicly. And our text says that they perceived that he was talking about them. We might make the connection right away that the son in the parable is the son of God, Jesus Christ. They maybe didn't make that connection, 
But even with what they had, it says the, the crowds perceived that Jesus was a prophet. They should have known that he was at least a prophet. He tells the story about how they killed the prophets who were sent and then killed the son who was sent. And two days later, they're making plans to kill him. Talk about needing to get hit with a brick in the front of the head so you can see the obvious, right? So who are then these tenants in the parable? Us. The tenants are these religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. How do we know? Because the parable tells us so. It says that they perceived that Jesus was talking about them. So it's the religious rulers of Israel. So there you have the story, right? And it's a summary of God's dealings with his people, climaxing in the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, who, by the way, here yet again, predicts his own execution and reveals just how significant that is. Why? Because what happens to him determines the fate. He is the chief cornerstone. And the one who falls over him, who stumbles over him, or the one on whom he, the stone, falls, is broken to pieces and crushed. And he asks them if they have never read the scriptures, and then he quotes to them Psalm 118. Now, of course, he knows that they have read it. They would have read it many, many, many times. They were exponentially more literate in the Bible, I'm sorry to say, than any of us here. But had they really read it, they would have understood that passage to be talking about them. They, they were the cornerstone chosen by God. But why didn't they realize then that the stone which God made into the cornerstone was the one that had been rejected? In their rejection of Jesus as the one sent from God, they fail to see that this passage refers to him, to Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the one whom God made the chief cornerstone. Now for us, cornerstones are those big blocks that you put kind of in the, the corner of a building to say when the building was built or what the name of the building was or, or to, to, to whom the building is uh, dedicated or memorialized. But in the time of Jesus, in the Roman era, the cornerstone referred to the top stone in a vaulted construction. So you've seen a vault made of stones, right? Ancient and ancient buildings at the top of the wall. Then you've got a stone that's leaning in. Why doesn't it fall? Because the top of it is resting against the stone above that, which is also leaning in. Why doesn't that one fall? Because there's another stone and another stone. All the way up on all the sides until you get to the top stone. They're all leaning equally against that stone, and that's what holds the whole thing together. So you pull that top stone out, and what happens? The whole thing collapses on top of you. Everything depends on that top stone. Everything depends on Jesus. Don't reject Jesus the way these chief priests and scribes do. But that was the history of Israel, wasn't it? Turning away from their Lord again and again and again and again and again. So God had revealed himself to his people so many times through the prophets, and what did they do? They turned away from him. Moses at Mount Sinai comes down from the mountain after having received the law. And there's all the people worshiping this golden calf. And he says, there, and what's going on here? And Aaron says, well, the people gave me their gold, and I, I threw it in the furnace, and this calf came out. <laughs> or out in the wilderness, God is supplying the people with manna in the desert. And they complain about it. They say, oh, if only we were still slaves back in Egypt where we got really good leeks and garlic. <laughs> And then there's the period of the judges, where they fall into these cycles of sin. God raises up a judge, and then God delivers them. And what do they do? They fall back into sin again. And he raises up a judge, and he delivers them. On and on and on. Judge is kind of like, like Gideon. Remember Gideon, who was threshing wheat in the wine press? He's down in a pit, threshing the wheat so that nobody sees him. He's looking up to make sure the Midianites aren't watching him so they don't come and steal his grain. And then he hides back down and he's threshing the wheat. And the angel comes and appears to him and says, Hail, mighty man of valor. Do you see the humor in that? Did you take my judge's course in Sunday school last year? Uh, if you did, you know what this means, right? 
And then God gave them a king because they wanted a king. Even though God said, your desire for a king means that you're rejecting me as your king. But he gave them kings. And sure enough, the kings led them astray. Like remember David's son, Solomon, the one who had 700 wives and 300 concubines? Or like one little girl said in Sunday school, 300 porcupines. <laughs> and the wives and concubines led him into idolatry, and he led Israel into idolatry. Almost all the kings of Judah and, and, and all the kings of Israel were bad and led the people into idolatry, and they kept falling into sin. Remember when Elijah complained to Ahab uh, that, that all the, that, or complained to God that Ahab had, had killed all the prophets? And after their great encounter where Elijah had had that conflict with the prophets of Baal, he built the altar and he put the meat from the sacrifice bowl on top of the altar. And then he poured 12 huge jugs of water on top of the whole thing. And then fire came down and consumed it all. One little girl in Sunday school, she said he poured the water on that was to make the gravy. <laughs> but once again, the people rejected the prophet. Or Jeremiah, the one that they threatened to kill. And they ended up throwing him into a pit. And that was not a barbecue pit, I'll tell you that. Israel's history was a history of apostasy, followed by another apostasy and another and another. And when you think about it, doesn't that describe a lot of us? Have you ever had a time in your life where you drifted away from God? Maybe a little, maybe a lot. Your life with the Lord was not what it should have been. Maybe you stayed away from church too long or stopped reading the Bible. Maybe you even stopped praying for a while because you just didn't want to talk to God or face Him. Maybe your faith even started to shrink to the point where it just didn't play a central role in your life anymore. I've known people who have really walked with the Lord. People who just exuded this wonderful, genuine enthusiasm for how God had intervened miraculously in their lives and poured out such grace and mercy upon them. They were genuine and sincere, wonderful Christians. And then they wandered into sin. They fell far away from the light, deep into themselves, deep into their self-pursuits. But even if you've never done that, all of us, if we don't fall into outright apostasy and become total prodigals, don't we all sometimes drift back and forth? Sometimes we're full of zeal. Other times we're very lukewarm in spirit. When it comes to your discipleship, your following after Jesus Christ, how many of you can say that it's always bigger and better, onward and upward? Um, I think our normal experience is you have some good days, you have some bad days, good seasons and bad seasons, maybe even good years or bad years. Maybe you haven't stoned any prophets lately, but when the words of the apostles and the prophets, the words that are preserved for us in Scripture and the Bible, when they were brought to you, have you ever snuffed them out? When you had opportunities to hear the word, or when the Holy Spirit was bringing up to your remembrance the word that you had previously in your life stored down in your heart, did you ever push it back down again? So if the Jews in this parable reflected this pattern from the history of Israel of continually falling back into a rejection of the ones that God had sent to them, and if at the end of the parable, he destroys them and gives the vineyards to others, which, by the way, reflects what Paul tells us in the book of Romans, doesn't it? That the rejection that the Jews made of the Christ was the reason why God opened up the gospel and brought it to us, the Gentiles. But if in that parable, those who rejected were destroyed, will everything be permanently taken from us too? When we fall. If you're familiar with Paul's argument there in Romans, then you know that the answer is no. no. And Jesus is not giving a different answer here in this parable either. 
You know, earlier in the sermon, I was working with you to identify the corresponding elements in this story, but there was one that I left out. Are you in this parable anywhere? I want to caution you to beware when you're reading the Bible of always trying to find yourself. And so we're always in there somehow. The Bible is not about us. It's Christ's story. We're trying to see ourselves in Christ's stories. But in this case, in this parable, you're in there. Did you know that? The master is God. The son is the son of God. The servants are the prophets. The tenants are the unfaithful religious leaders. And you are the vineyard. You are the vineyard. The parable doesn't perfectly correspond with the Old Testament story that Nadine read from Isaiah 5, but one of the things that does carry over is the vineyard. The vineyard in the Old Testament text and in this text, it is God's people. In the Old Testament, God's people would have been the people of Israel, but in the New Testament, who are God's people? Why, those who have been baptized into Christ, those who by faith in Christ have been made part of God's family. You are his people. You are his vineyard. And the Isaiah text says that it's a love song for his, his beloved. Why? Because the master loves his vineyard. The reason the master is so furious with those unfaithful tenants is because of the way they have mishandled his vineyard. His vineyard is clearly precious to him. He loves his vineyard. In our Sunday school lesson today, if you can stay as we go into Revelation chapter 6, you'll see this, and you'll see it elsewhere in Revelation. And I can show you places all across the Bible where the reason God will send his wrath with such ferocity against those who harm you or hurt you is because his people, his vineyard, that's you. And he loves his vineyard. The reason he's so jealous of everything that tries to lure you away from him, the reason he will one day destroy all of those things utterly, is because he loves his vineyard. And finally, he sends his son for the sake of the vineyard, into a situation where the son is ultimately killed. Why does he do that? Because he loves his vineyard. I invite you now to rise and join me in confessing that all Christians believe in the words of the apostles. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of that earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayers. The prayer of the church today uh, for LWML Sunday is adapted from the evening prayer in the LSB, and so it's chanted. So I'm not really super big on chanting, but I've been here four years, we've never done it. So once in four years, that's okay, right? Uh, so uh, as I come to the end of my part, let us pray to the Lord. And you come in with Lord at the same time as I say Lord on the same note. So let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord.
and to support global missions through the gathering of mites and providing of mission grants, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For all your kingdom people, that they may produce kingdom fruit to your glory for the expansion of your kingdom on earth, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For those who advance order in our society, civil righteousness, health and protection in accord with your will, let us pray to the
the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Amen.
just a reminder, Sunday school, because we've been ending the services a little earlier, we switched the time. So instead of 10.30 to 11.15, now Sunday school meets from 10.15 to 11, 10.15 to 11. So you have to grab your coffee quick and, and run downstairs. We've got about 15 minutes for that. Children's Sunday School is meeting. Uh, tomorrow is uh, a presentation by the Midwest Creation Fellowship at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church in Antioch. So I think there are several of us going. So if anyone's interested, let me know. I'll get you the details on that. And then the men's breakfast is this coming Wednesday at 8 o'clock. And then... Uh, uh, she's not going to be here next week because they're going down to Florida. So I want to call attention to Judy in the back who has put up with Ken now for 16 years. 16 years. So be sure to wish that to be Any other announcements? Pastor, yes, just very briefly, because some of you were not here last week. I mentioned about uh, going downstairs. You can also attend pastor's class then, but... As we have the upstairs renovated up here, it's all complete now downstairs. So please take a look downstairs and see what is done down there. The lightings, all the rooms are renovated, the Sunday school rooms and things like that. All done at no cost, or very little cost to the congregation. And uh, members from the congregation doing all the labor on there. So we want to thank everyone for that. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you.